Yeah. Well, thanks everyone for joining us. I'm John Lyons, the Director of Programming for the Film Society of Northwestern Pennsylvania, and this is our fourth film under quarantine, Once Were Brothers, Robbie Robertson and the Band. And we have two panelists today. We've got Alan Carpenter and Mike Berlin. Guys, give a hello. Hi there. How's it going? <laughs> Cheers, rah, rah. Yeah, So uh, thanks everybody for joining us. Um, we'll keep it with the panel for initial thoughts and um, some discussion and then we'll open it up and, and see what everybody uh, has to say and, and add. Um, personally, I was talking to Alan before we started. Um, my familiarity with the band really was uh, Scorsese's documentary, The Last Waltz. Um, I am very much a newbie seeing this film, um, really made me want to watch The Last Waltz again. And as I'm sure we'll get into, uh, we were talking before we started with Mike and Alan, um, kind of the other sides of the story. Levon has a book um, and uh, I guess a documentary you said as well, Mike. Yes. Um, yeah. So there's uh, there's different uh, different aspects of the story as as there are oftentimes. Um, you know, this film is titled uh, "Once We're Brothers," Robbie Robertson and the band, which <laughs> um, I find interesting after watching the film. Um, it's like saying, you know. Kurt Cobain and Nirvana, or you know, it's like pick any band, and uh, it it seems like uh, that might be cause for for friction right there. But um, I thought that the documentary was uh, insightful, entertaining. Obviously, the music's great. Um, you know, I I didn't know anything about the connections with uh, Dylan and Clapton and everyone else that's. Uh, that's featured in the film. So I guess to start off, um, what did you guys think of the film in general? What did it get right? What did it get wrong? Uh, did you learn anything? Um, and we'll just open it up with that question first. Who wants Alan, to would you like to uh, take it? Or I, guess like I'll, jump yeah, off or? I guess I'll, I'll kick things off. Well, I really enjoyed uh, I, I'm a, been a fan of the band for decades and read a lot of books and watched a lot of movies and a lot of documentaries and so forth and so on. Uh, I really enjoyed the background, Robbie's background, because all we really know, knew before was that Robbie is First Nations on one side and on his other side, his, his real birth father was a Jewish gangster. Now that's the makings of a legend right there, obviously. So to see that all portrayed in the film, I really enjoyed And for him. To, he hasn't talked about that at length much until he wrote his own book. Uh, I thought that, that part of the film particularly looked beautiful. I think the whole film looked really gorgeous. Um, and obviously, as John said, the music was great, but it is Robbie's narrative. Um, and, it, and it is Robbie Robertson and the band. And the, the thing that I would just remind people is when the band came out and sort of made their initial impact, one of the things that made them so mysterious to people is they didn't have a leader. And in retrospect, everybody says, well, Robbie wrote the songs, he's the leader. He was the leader. He wa there was no leader. And people wondered how this amalgam worked together and who was singing what part and who wrote what part. And that was part of their magic. And obviously now in retrospect, it, it looks different. And I, I think that should have been pointed out in the movie a little more. Um, they should have spent more time on the whole dynamics of how they all work together, because that was the magic. That's what people didn't understand, is it wasn't the Jimi Hendrix experience. It wasn't even the Beatles with two main songwriters and two guys back here. It was everyone playing equal roles and coming in and out of this musical stew. But uh, I mean, it's a very enjoyable film and Robbie is so well-spoken. He's such an intelligent guy that it makes, he tells a story really well. And that, that made it very enjoyable. Yeah, to piggyback, um, I didn't know the story about that. I didn't know that he didn't know that he, he grew up with the, the, 
the guy who the man who raised him was not his like biological father. I did not know that. I was like, I don't Boy, think I, I did look. either. And that was, and I, I did enjoy sort of a because I just love the band and the whole mythology of it, and um, th that was sort of interesting to me because, as you said, it's like, wow, this right there is someone who talked about like a you know sort of a folklore already mm -hmm. being uh, being sort of developed and stuff like that, and it, it sort of goes along well with his ultimately even when he meets his wife and like with his style of. Uh, with his style of writing, because what the band really becomes known for is sort of this, uh, like this Melville type of we're going to tell, we're going to take you down Americana and we're going to tell you this story about and just like this John Henry type of story or something like that. And uh, and Robertson really uh, he he really grasped onto that. Now, as you said, it is his story. It is a hundred percent his story. And John, we talked about this a little bit on Monday and stuff like that, but. Sometimes you, I, it's hard for me, and maybe these are, this is the 21st century, I get a little cynical when I'm only hearing one side of things. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, now I have the benefit of knowing a lot more about the band and knowing some of the, and we'll talk about this, uh, knowing about some of the things that uh, happen behind scenes. But, uh, but listening to him, he, like, we get a little bit into, it's nice to hear him actually talk about the writing process, particularly of the weight, which is what they're most known for, but he really glosses over some of the, uh, the uncomfortable uh, tensions and frictions that start to happen, particularly around the time of like the third album, Stage Fright and stuff like that. And even beforehand, uh, some of the complications that arose uh, back in 65 when they were touring with Dylan. Very true. Interesting. Yeah. And he, he was, uh, I mean, you know, if you are going to focus on somebody, he is a, a good, compelling, intelligent speaker, as you said, Alan. So, you know, from an outsider perspective, um, I, I felt like, yeah, it was grounded in the foundation of the songwriting, which was kind of the narrative they were trying to tell as far as the band and his story, the band as well. Um, but I did appreciate when they had the other, because the other personalities were great that they, um, you know, from, from the band and from the outside, um, you know, the, the stories did kind of keep um, his kind of even keel approach in, in check, I think, and broke up um, that, that story a little bit, which, which I appreciate. I would have, like you, Mike, would have liked to see more of that, maybe. Um, you know, a little more even um, of, a, of a background revisit um, from from all members, but but this is what we have. Um, well, it's it's important to, to to your point, John. It's important to think like I think we can sort of go back a little bit here and stuff like that. Like some of the things that Rob, that they don't talk, that Robbie doesn't talk about is uh, one of the problems that the band originally had was that. Uh, as they're doing the basement, uh, the basement sessions, uh, which is which would be late, uh, later released and stuff like that. One of the problems was that people didn't like his singing voice, which is how the other members of the band they were trying to figure out as mm -hmm. they were going on, uh, like who was going to take the lead. So Danko ends up singing a little bit. Emmanuel ends up shooting a little bit, and Levon ends up shooting a little bit, and. You know, and, and, and to his credit, I think as he's starting to become more familiar with each of their singing styles and their range, I think that's where he, he starts to compose and write the songs with not having the pressure of singing. And I think that was genuine, but he's also, he's starting to hear their voices in his head mm -hmm. as he's songwriting. Yeah, that's very true. And one thing that they did really well in the first couple albums, and I don't want to be too inside baseball here, but in the first couple albums, that they did they did less and less as they went on sadly except for a couple songs was to have those voices weave in line by line so you know uh, uh rick is singing a line and then richard sings a line and then levon sings the next line and there's a rhythm not only from the instruments but from these voices coming in on top of each other and that was something that sadly they kind of got away from until uh, they did the uh, Northern Light Southern Cross album, which was their return to form. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And it's it sort of, I almost wonder in a way, if Robbie got got a little uh, too comfortable with saying, well, this is a Levon song, or this is a, you know, this needs a soulful, you know, a tear in the voice song. So this is a Richard Manuel song. I wonder. Well, I, I wonder, I, I kind of suspect, and here's where I'll defend him on some level, 
it probably got, this is where the drug use probably became difficult mm-hmm. to yeah. try to try to tie people down and uh, try to get them to sort of, con- because whenever you sort of do that Greek chorus sort of intertwining of song, like people have to be on their mark and on their yeah. beat. And it probably get, that probably got really difficult at that point. And I think that in defense to Robbie was one of the things that uh, that's where you could defend him, where it's just yeah. like, it, it really probably got difficult to get all the guys in the studio, have mm-hmm. their attention and have their focus. But boy, it's when glorious when they did it. When they did it, it was so magical. Yeah. 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 I, I mean, mean, so unique. Before uh, all of the car crashes, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, Alan, because of <laughs> car crashes. Alan, talking about, um, you know, combining all of these voices, I mean, that, it seems like such a... Uh, a unique type of band. I mean, back, you know, you're you're our uh, obviously our our master here of of music. So, how unique really was it to have a band that could have so many singers, so many moving parts? Um, it seems like s- such a unique thing. It was a unique thing. What was what's really interesting about the band is we think of them now as being this sort of countryish, folkish. Uh, you know, ensemble band, Americana, as that kind of music later came to be known. But really, they were, and we were talking uh, about this before airtime, really, they were a rhythm and blues band, uh, essentially. Yeah, they grew up with some country in the backgrounds and so forth. And uh, Garth Hudson played organ in his uncle's funeral home. So that's, you know, that's sort of where a lot of his uh, his uh, crazy techniques came from. But after they went into the basement with Bob Dylan after the, you know, the, the tour um, and Dylan sort of sat down and they all, they learned just everyone obviously high on controlled substances, uh, singing folk songs and country songs and getting this sort of crash course in it. And then that sort of got overlaid on their rhythm and blues sort of expertise. And that's how sort of how their song their sound came out. Really, rhythm and blues and gospel is the base of their music more than folk and country. The folk and country is almost an accent in their music, but now we hear it as the the dominant note. Um, for you, John, I wanted to ask you because you don't maybe know as much about the the records and the music as we do. Did you get a big enough taste <clears throat> taste of the music in the in the course of the movie? Because there was a lot of talking. Yeah, I mean, I. I... I could have used more, sure. Um, uh, I mean, I have, you know, my my little quirks with the movie. It did seem to rely on kind of like touchstone songs mm. and it really kind of edited to the rhythm of the song. And I, I thought some of the, the editing was bland, but when the music's so good, um, you know, it's, I, I don't know, I, I was, I did like what I heard, but yeah, I mean, it really does make me want to track down, I guess, at least the, first two albums i i was going to suggest you do a deep dive into them because you know the brown album the second album with the night they drove old dixie down and rag mama rag is such a classic that music from big pink that first album it's strange it's it's if i were to compare it to anything it's almost like a country devo it's like what universe did this come from then there's nobody on the cover in the band it's a painting by bob dylan Inside, it's the members standing around with their extended family on farmland. Huh. And this is the year of Sergeant Pepper. And, and it, it just was like this dropped out of another universe thing. And it's still an odds. That's with, the as uh, I know Stu loves, Chest Fever and In a Station and all these songs. They're very strange. And uh, they're, they're familiar in, in that sense of feeling historic and grounded. But they're also unfamiliar. It's it, it's a really odd record. It's it's my favorite band album for that reason. I mean that's a great that's a great point too because this is the era of psychedelic rock. Sure. And, and it's just like that was not what was necessarily game played on top forty. And again, and I don't know, I, I I don't have the Billboard charts in front of me and stuff like that. But I do think that they were a group, uh, and this is probably the influence of Al Grossman that was championed by the critics for a while before the audience before audiences caught on because remember once upon a time we did not have spotify we did not have like you know <laughs> like, you really had to rely on word of mouth and uh yeah. and acetates the lucky ones got acetates of you know the the basement sessions but that's an excellent point mike because 
um, critics and musicians. I mean, as, as Clapton said, he literally heard that album and went, I'm not going to do Cream anymore. I'm done. Done. I don't want to do this. Uh, George Harrison heard it and it influenced his entire career from that point forward. Um, the, uh, you know, when, when the birds went from, you know, sort of psychedelic folk rock to country, the first song on the country album is a song from the basement tapes. Yeah. You know, it, it just, it was such a huge influence on, on music. And, and uh, I remember reading, and I think it's in Levon's book, Levon's book, uh, cuts no corners and, and, and does not suffer fools. And he's like, you know, it's funny. We made an album with a brown cover and us standing around in a black and white picture and sold, I don't know, a million albums. And then along comes Crosby, Stills and Nash makes an album with a brown cover and them standing around in a black and white picture and sells 10 million albums. Wonder where they got the idea. Uh, but again, you know, all kidding aside, it was people really began to ape them. You know, everybody wanted to be in a sepia tone, cowboy outfit uh and the and, and the ironic thing is that was just how the band dressed they just took a picture that was them literally standing on a road in uh, in woodstock yeah and i found it, it so interesting that um like you know seeing all the behind the scenes footage like i would not have expected a, a band to like be dressed like that like in real life yeah, <laughs> yeah. Know, just hanging out in in suits and you know it's like out in the country. Old timey suits and that was <laughs> literally just how they dressed. Yeah. I mean, I, I always wonder like, do you, th I wonder if there's something and not, I'm not by any stretch of the imagination a fashion person, but it does sort of speak to sort of almost a civil war era and stuff like that. And if, I wonder if there was a little bit like, you know, was that there's some inspiration in that? You know, I wonder that, I've always wondered, and this is kind of an odd sort of pivot, but I've always wondered, you know, in that era, like the Sgt. Pepper era, a lot of old timey clothes were sort of the hippest thing you could wear. Coming back, so yeah. Like happened with our hipsters, uh, you know, a decade ago or so. So I wonder if the band were like, well, we can kind of do that our way. Yeah. Um, it's, it reminds me of a parallel to, the, you know, one of the reasons Bob Dylan grew his hair out because it was the Beatles had long hair. Well, when Bob grew his, it became the Bob Dylan hair. So I wonder if they were just picking up things in the zeitgeist, but they were they were doing it in their own, in this really unique way and personal way. And so it somehow, it, it took a different direction. I've always yeah. wondered that about that. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about uh, Dylan, uh, round one with Bob Dylan and uh, being booed every night and uh, leave on. Uh, saying sayonara. What, what were you guys' feelings? On, I, assuming you're already familiar with the story, no, sure. um, maybe maybe give us uh, some insight into the internal struggles of the band and um, you know bringing in the uh, tour de force of Bob Dylan and how that kind of changed every everything from that point forward. Well. I think, uh, and we talked about this before and stuff like that, and I'll just sort of uh, repeat what I, when we were talking and stuff like that. Um, it's an interesting thing. Uh, obviously, uh, I forget, what was uh, the folk artist's name? Uh, John, uh, John, John Hammond. Hammond. John Hammond, and they, they, Dylan sees them, and he's looking for, you know, as we said, the baddest band in the land to sort of back him up. And uh, couldn't have get more dumb lucky than Bob Dylan did with uh, that discovery mm -hmm. and stuff like that. But now at the same time, so the band goes out with Dylan and they're getting just, they're coming. It's just totally different styles of audience that they're coming from because they're coming from this rhythm and blues sort of celebration of music where people go to enjoy it. And then you've got this sort of high minded folk Americana scene that's happening. And it, it's much more introspective. It's much more, I'm thinking about things and uh, probably on psychedelics and stuff like that. And when Dylan decides to go electric, which we know is this seminal music uh, period of music history, it's like his audience rejected it foolishly, absolutely foolishly. And we had talked about on some level for Helm, it, leave on Helm, it was a difficult thing because you're going from being not just, and here's the other thing, to remember, it was Levon Helm and the Hawks for a minute and the Canadian Squires. Mm -hmm. So Levon, for a moment, is almost becoming the face of the band. 
And then they end up getting uh, picked up by Bob Dylan. And now he, you know, and I'm sure he was okay with going back to the drum kit, but he wasn't loving getting booed every night. <laughs> and, and they, and the, the story also, and the thing that I've always sort of wondered personally, uh, there was a Arkansas rhythm and blues, very famous uh, um, performer named uh, Sonny Boy Williamson the second. And they were on the brink, they, they had met him and they were thinking about record, they were talking about recording uh, an album with him and he passes away. And I think that there was just this, just immense wave of disappointment for him at that point. And he was getting, he was getting sick of the day in, day, day in, day out of getting booed. And he just said, fuck it. <laughs> and went and did the, uh, did the oil rig. And that was yeah. Levon. <laughs> it was all or nothing with Levon. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. It's kind of interesting, you know, the, 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 uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to steal Mike's word. The seminal, uh, uh, concert from all of those performances is what came to be known as the Royal Albert Hall, Albert Hall show, which was oh, finally yeah. released a few years ago, uh, officially by Columbia and being a Dylan fan. And I was a Dylan fan before I was a band fan. And I finally heard the official release of it. I think I had a crappy bootleg cassette before and I never really bothered with it. But listening to it on, you know, on, on a well-mastered CD, what's astonishing is um, not only that the bands sound really good, but the bands sound good creating a kind of music that just didn't exist before that concert. They're taking these folk songs with these introspective lyrics and they're playing with as much, you know, force and meaning. It's loud, it's powerful, it's precise. And uh, Robbie, as a lead guitarist, he's taking Dylan's melodies and making these just feral guitar solos out of them. Um, it's astonishing music. And the version they do of Like a Rolling Stone is just regal. It's huge. It's beautiful. And um, what astonishes me is this is the same group of guys who go on to make Big Pink, which sounds nothing <laughs> like what they're doing there. Yeah. A couple years later, it's astonishing. Oh, and a fun footnote, um, if I'm, and Alan, correct me if I'm wrong, the basement tapes actually eventually, when they do, Angel the band ends up sort of getting notoriety and fame, and the basement tapes, I think actually end up becoming like the first underground bootleg mm -hmm. uh, LP in American yes. history. Yes, right? it was called and, it was called and, Great White Wonder. The Great White, yes, Great White Wonder, and uh, it, it like this is this becomes a big deal as not so much for the group and the for Dylan and stuff like that, but from how a marketing strategy that mm -hmm. the labels will end up uh, repeating even to this day with rap and hip hop with mixtapes. Sure, it really, you could really draw it back to that on some level so yeah and it's interesting yeah. too when you hear the basement tapes and you hear robbie's compositions they're almost there they're good but they're not big pink brown album later work good he, you can hear him developing and learning from dylan but also being robbie and i don't know as a guy who plays a little guitar i don't know how you can be around bob dylan and not want to be bob dylan i think robbie has a very strong personality <laughs> yeah Oh, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. So, oh. and they yeah. and they remained uh, they've remained friends, I think. Yeah, to this day too. Yeah. That's true. Sorry, John. Go ahead. No, no, no worries. I was just gonna say, uh, um, yeah. So Levon leaves. Uh, Robbie says that I have it written down here that it, that he didn't realize before the possibility of using poetry in songwriting, and that it gave a sense of liberty and kind of no rules or broke the rules at that point. Um, so how do we, uh, how do we get up to the, to the weight? Um, and you know, the first year and a half of touring and it being amazing and everyone sharing the spotlight on stage again, and everyone loves each other. Um, it's, it sounds like, a, an incredible time for everyone in the band. And of course, then we get into the, the story of uh, drugs and alcohol and fame. <laughs> well, I think it's distance makes the heart grow fonder. I mean, uh, the reality is, is in a very weird way that Levon going to the oil rig probably saved him a little bit. Like it probably would have self-combusted. And then they finally had this period because they were a traveling band that never took nights off. 
uh, even uh, even when they were uh, backing up Dylan and everything like that, that they finally had time to sort of all of a sudden come together and write and be this collective that they had never had to do before. And they had time. And if you're a great artist, there is no greater currency than time and, you know, room to think. And that was, and that was probably an important part to play of Woodstock. There, there's a reason that even when they went out to Malibu and stuff like that, it doesn't sound quite as, it doesn't sound quite as original and as interesting as the stuff that they did at, at Big Pink. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think with a, with a Brown album, you know, that material came from that, that time. Um, but here's a, here's a fun fact. I don't know if you know this one, John. I think Mike probably does, but they recorded the Brown album, the second album, in Sammy Davis Jr.'s Beach House. Yeah. They put a studio in there. Oh, okay. It seems like the most oh. unband like <laughs> venue one can imagine. Yeah. Well, it seems like, yeah, they were, uh, they did things their own way. That's, that's awesome. It fits, right? Yeah. Why not? What the hell? <laughs> yeah. It's interesting when, when, when they get to the situation uh, with drugs and, and, and also um, a lot of alcohol too. I mean, the, the, the movie talked a lot about heroin, but there was a lot, a lot of drinking. And from, from all of these sort of third party uh, um, descriptions, what happened is, is you know, Richard and, and Levon went off on that heroin side and Robbie being someone who became very enamored of Hollywood went off on the cocaine side. And those have two different effects on the human constitution. Right. That was the interesting. He doesn't, again, he doesn't touch on any of these things. When no. it's like, and no. there, there is, everything is like, it's like, yeah, but that's a little bit of a half truth on yeah. some level with Robbie. And, uh, you know, and, and again, to his, uh, to his credit a little bit, I think he is a family man and he is thinking about these things. And it's very hard to be unabashedly, you know, honest about it. It's, yeah. It is. But you know, also, it's the story of uh, how many great bands of that era. It's not unusual. Uh, what was unusual is just how good they were. But how they fell apart, unfortunately, is a very common story. Yeah. It, it was the weight of expectations. Uh, because, I mean, the saying is you have forever to write your first album. And then you normally, with record contracts now, you only have about, you know, a year to write your second. Mm -hmm. That's difficult. Talk about uh, what are some of your favorite tracks, your favorite albums? Um, I'm making a, a, a list here as you guys talk about the, <laughs> the Royal Albert show and Great White Wonder. And so give, give me some more material uh, and all of our listeners and viewers, um, you know, hit, hit on some of your favorites and highlights and um, inventive tunes that you really appreciate from the band. Yeah, for me, it's, it's the, the first two albums are great. Um, obviously, music from Big Pink and, and the one just called The Band or commonly known as The Brown Album. Um, as I mentioned earlier, they had sort of a return to form with an album, a very slickly produced but beautiful sounding record called Northern Light Southern Cross. And what you find from listening to that album is how absolutely crucial Garth Hudson was because Garth would stay with, and they were not, getting along well and there were substances floating around, but Garth would stay and put on layers of, of keyboards and synths and horns and things. So it's a beautiful multi-layered um, recording. Uh, individual songs, I, they're probably, I probably like the ones everybody likes, you know? I, I like the weight, I like the night they drove old Dixie down. Um, I like- Particularly the last waltz one. Yeah, well, yeah. Uh, that is- yeah. Well, you know, speaking of which, in the book, now this might, this kind of sounds like a little bit of a, a, a little bit of storytelling, but I don't know. Levon claims he sings that so passionately because he was so angry at Robbie for ending the band that he's singing the song basically about him driving the band into the ground at that point. That might not be fair. As, much as, I as much as I love Levon, that might not be fair. Yeah, yes. Because, I mean, Levon at the end there, and uh, there's... There's things that you can, there's a lot of interviews you can find because he wasn't, uh, he wasn't, he was, he was game to talking about things, but mm -hmm. he just, he was just tossing venom 
he at Robin, sure every shot that he could. And he, he does kind of come across just as bitter. And I think a little bit of this too is obviously they were hurt because Robbie had more of the publishing rights and everything like that. So they weren't profit uh, and Levon didn't handle his money. Well, there's uh, if you go and watch the Levon, oh, no, they he go into his bankruptcy. And, yeah. uh, and at that point, it, and he's just, he's bitter. He's, oh, he's just, very bitter. He's just bitter. And it, it's, it's, it's sad because this is, he is, he is a great, great American musician. Yeah, to me, in a way, he, he sort of, if you had to make one member of the band, to me, it is Levon. He's the guy with the heritage. He's the guy with the history. Yes. He's so incredibly multi-talented. Um, and yes, Robbie wrote those great songs, but Levon is just the grit that that needed. But, but the heart. Yeah. The heart. What, 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 what's your choice for album, since I gave mine? Oh, and, and we're very dull. What everybody loves. It, it's not. Uh, it's not dull. Uh, I. I. I love Big Pink. Obviously, it's nothing like. But uh, I love the second album. Obviously, and uh, Stage Fright. I love Stage Fright. Actually. Oh, Stage Fright. Uh, yeah. Um. I, I just. I can go back. I go back to it pretty regularly. Um. Uh, Stage Fright is their third album. Um. As far as uh, songs, I mean, Hello Cleveland, uh, Old Trombone. Uh, I, it, of yeah. course, I, of course, I love the you know up on Cripple Creek will always get my foot tapping. And sure. Stuff like that. Uh, even some of the uh, even some of the um, the newer stuff that they did, they they do a great great cover of Atlantic City yes, uh, they... from uh, their album uh, Jericho, uh, it, which uh, yeah, I, I mean the boss is the boss, but boy, I I probably would take that cover. So. Yeah, it's hard it's hard to get a lyric like that to leave on and not have it move you. Yeah. He has a way of just, it's no wonder he was such a great actor. It's, I, I, in a way, I mean, Robbie was in movies and Levon was in a few movies and really Levon was a better actor. Levon's a better actor. <laughs> yeah, he just had so much charisma and so much presence as a human being. 100%, 100%. And uh, yeah, I'm trying to think, uh, what's another one that I love? Um, out of this world, uh, I, I think I'm saying that uh, Out of This World, uh, which they do a cover uh, or Oh, it's a great song. Yeah, uh, the one particularly that they do on the waltz, uh, last mm. waltz, is just like, it's heartbreakingly beautiful. Danko's voice, I think out of all of them too, sometimes, Danko's voice can sometimes just get to the root of a song, particularly mm -hmm. the slower ballads. Uh, they were all, such phenomenally unique, talented, like artists. And for that, for them to all come together, I, I just won't get that. No, and the difference in those voices, you know, they, I yeah. mean, Levon's got that, that, just that soulful honking voice. Richard's got that tear in his voice. He's got that Ray Charles quality. I don't, I never could really put a finger on uh, Rick Danko's technique of singing. It is so singular. Uh, it's a, it's sort of like the way a country singer sings, but not quite. Right. Oh man. It's, it's original. <laughs> It's just original because oh, right. even Leave Yvonne Levon and even uh, Richard, like I've heard those voices before, mm -hmm. but Danko, it's nobody kind of sang like him. No, and he was just like he was just that guy. If you if you, if you've played sports, maybe he wasn't like the one who practiced or did all the fundamental. But like once it came time to play in the game, he was just good. He was just yeah. a good athlete. Yes, that he was just a good musician. There's a there's a scene uh, in when they're high off of everything in the last waltz and they're Scorsese's just doing uh sort of testimonials with different uh, groups of the band and Danko just he's obviously off his rocker but he's playing a violin just off of his chest <laughs> and it's and he's just he's putzing around and it's pretty good mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like oh my god the music came easy to him yeah yeah, that's a beautiful scene too because it's it, it's like when you're with your friends and everybody's together and you're laughing about you forgot what you're laughing at. They're sort of at that point. And they're just goofing off and it's just pure fun. Yeah, yeah, I, I, and uh, you know, and we talked about it. And the last waltz has its own mythology to it and everything like that. Uh, that and Alan, we were talking beforehand. They ran out of uh, film in the middle of the last waltz, which is why they had the wait before they filmed the, before they performed the wait. Uh, so everybody assumes that the last waltz is the, the concert is the last time that they perform with each other. And Scorsese is losing his mind and losing his shit. And Scorsese 
had a very famous temper, uh, particularly during his cocaine years. Uh, right, I was going to say cocaine and he was as well. Losing his mind on his camera operators, telling them how they will never work ever again, and all that kind of stuff. And uh, the production manager, like the line producer, that night are on the horn calling everybody that they possibly can in San Francisco because they got to, they know that they have to get the weight. There's no movie without the wait, but uh, they're calling everywhere that they possibly can. They get the uh, San Francisco Opera Hall to open up their doors, and they have to get this shot because at this point, the band can't stand each other anymore. <laughs> they have to get some of these things shot, uh, and some of these moments that they missed out. And uh, so there's some weird scenes in the last vault set, as Alan just said. It's like, it just sort of sticks out there. It's like, what is going on here? It does. Uh, and I think that's a, a really interesting thing on some level is you talk about how it's unique for uh, the band to have multiple singers and stuff like that. And there's something almost poetic about the fact that the Staples, the Staples mm -hmm. singers, like, because that was a group where all the voices were very intricate to one another and that at different, uh, different people would take the lead. Right. And there's something Absolutely. sort of unique about like the, their most famous song and they bring, uh, they bring the Staples singers in with that. Yeah, and Mavis Staples sounds glorious. Ah, ah, Incredible. She kills it. She kills it. Yeah. Just so everyone knows, uh, The Last Waltz is on Amazon Prime. So uh, if you're like me, as soon as we wrap tonight, that's what I'm going to be watching again. Um, I'm going to unmute everybody right I'm now. Gonna, like scathing response to that. Oh, Erica. Erica. <laughs> <laughs> like, all of my we join right, Erica. I'm going to mute Erica. <laughs> <laughs> so I will unmute everybody else. And uh, let's open it up, guys. And uh, what did you think about the film? Stu? <laughs> I loved it. I thought it was totally awesome. Um, I was always been a big fan of them. I remember actually when I was really young, I was kind of like, who are these hillbillies dressed up playing Southern Rebels, you know, talking about Robert E. Lee. And, uh, but I, I grew to appreciate them in my high school years and just completely loved them. Uh, you know, they were like the, the first jam band kind of, but they don't, like they said, they were, we don't jam, you know, but, uh, they were in that essence, but I didn't know about the Dylan stuff so much. Um, I did not know about all the heroin use in like the Cleveland show. Uh, you know, very cool though. Very cool information. Um, yeah, you know, sad story, but, uh, but yeah, awesome Fun music. Fact, according to Joan Baez, uh, Robert E. Lee was a ship. Okay. okay. <laughs> she does a rendition. I of, do. She does a rendition of the song, and it's like, I, she refers to Robert E. Lee, like, she changed the lyrics a little bit, and uh, it's Robert E. Lee is like a boat in her version or something like that. <laughs> okay. Okay, fun fact. <laughs> yeah, weird, <laughs> just weird. I heard, I heard, though, in The Last Waltz, there was a little rotoscoping that was going on with Neil Young. Uh, has anyone ever heard that story? Oh, yes. about, about, yeah, about the, uh, the cocaine booger. The booger yeah. sugar. Yeah, the booger yes. sugar. Yeah. <laughs> for real? <laughs> this is for real? They had to rotoscope yeah. his nostril, yeah. 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 yeah I, I, so I, much cool. And if you look at him, man, and funny. if you know some people who do have done cocaine, then he's sitting there and he's just like, kind of like, he's into it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's having fun. You know, and but they zoom in, I think, on a tight shot, and it's this is uh, you know, I don't know, Hollywood lore or whatever you want to call it, but yeah, they had to or Scorsese rotoscoped out his cocaine in packed nose. <laughs> oh, shit. Afterwards, uh, so I saw I have seen a print of Last Waltz, which again was pretty great to hear it and see it that way. Uh, and there is no rotoscoping in the print, and it is, Ooh. I mean, it is, and it's super prominent, like it's wow. like, oh, yeah. Wow. It's it's not like a dab. You it's not like you don't have to be looking for it. It's just like it's like oh yeah, that guy was doing lines. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> Allie, do you want to jump in with your thoughts? Uh, that's what I was saying. I was gonna say I wish there were um, more cocaine on stage moments. Um, <laughs> I, I thought the movie was fine. It was a little bit mild though. Like um, I wish there were a lot more live uh, live footage, and then. Uh, Juan was saying that, yeah, watch The Last Waltz. It's a lot, it's all live footage. Like, that's what I was looking for. I felt like, 
I, I do feel like I was agreeing with Mike that it was a little one-sided um, and just hearing all from Robertson. But uh, yeah, I mean, I loved when they talked about the hypnotist on stage with him. Oh, right, that yeah, was that was cool. Oh, bro. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's bizarre. Interesting fun fact. If you want to uh, go to the place where Dylan went to first hear the band in Toronto, you can just go to what is now the uh, Hard Rock Cafe. There's a plaque there, and that's where Albert took Dylan to hear the band the first time. No shit. At the Hard Rock Cafe in Toronto. So you can make a pilgrimage there. I can do that. And yeah, all the, not terribly all great. the rockabilly stuff. No clue about any of the rockabilly stuff. Really? Uh, from his, yeah, never knew any about that stuff, which is great, too. I mean, it kind of just – it it shows where his bases came from. And also his little trips that he would take to the uh, Indian reservations and mm -hmm. to hear the uh, – the, uh, well, I say Indian reservations, but the, to hear the natives or whatever, freaking lack of <laughs> terminology, <laughs> playing their instruments at night when the sun goes down, you know? I mean, real spiritual, I, I would imagine. I love that part. I love that part of the movie. Yeah. Allie, are you like me and you're uh, a band newbie? Yeah, definitely. I didn't know the stuff about Dylan. Um, yeah, and I'm definitely, I'm like you that I'm like, okay, I, I'm going to watch The Last Waltz. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. Think like, yeah. Ditto. I think on some level, I can like, and I've been thinking about the film a lot today. Uh, it's one of the reasons that this film got made because I think that there is such a huge chunk of the population that is not as familiar. It's, it was easy to get for this group to get overlooked with uh, particularly in the era that they were coming out. And I think that there's been some um, recognition that it's like, Hey, we got to tell the story because Garth isn't like, he's pretty much, he's, he is out of the limelight now and Robbie's the only one left and they're just getting older. And yeah, at the end, I mean, it was like, oh, wow. Yeah, there's only a couple couple dudes left, right? Er Erica got emotional. They're like, they're all dead. It's like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah and pretty young, right? Like a bunch of them were in their 40s, if I recall. Yeah. If, yeah. if they hadn't put a lower third on uh, Hawks at the end, you know, as, at the, as interviews, I would have recognized him as being the same person. <laughs> Seriously, you know? Yeah. He looked a little weathered. It looked like the miles more than the years had gotten to him, you know? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Oh, yeah. I think, that, I, I think he'd agree with that. I think that's true. One thing, if, if you can seek out, I don't know, maybe it's on, on Prime now, the VH1 uh, classic albums did one on uh, the band on the Brown album, and that's really worth watching. Okay, uh, that goes more in depth into into the music and and just the uh, the good. dynamics of the group, which is I mean that's their secret, and that's what's really makes them so enduring and so unique. Nice. It's the interplay of you know what the band would do on occasion is if the drumming sounded too precise or too tight, they would take Levon off the drums on say Rag Mama Rag and put Richard Manuel in because yeah. Richard wasn't a good drummer and they wanted a loose feel. So there were, they did a lot of unorthodox things like that to get the sound, but they did it all within their little collective. That's kind of a unique approach. It's incredible. And I think a big part of that is Garth, honestly. Yes. And, and, and uh, the, here's the one thing, and if this tells you anything with all the infighting, the one person that they all continue to love from start to finish is Garth because mm -hmm. he was, he was the musical masterpiece. And it, it is, it's true. He, this was somebody who understood particularly when, you know, Moody Blues and Bach, mm -hmm. he, he really had, he, he was, he was their, he was their secret ingredient. Absolutely. Watching him was fun too. Oh yeah. I <laughs> love that, that scene of them doing, uh, doing up on Cripple Creek and, the thing that up on Cripple Creek, if you if you want to talk about the one thing that sticks out in your mind, it's that jaw harp sound, which is of course Garth on a clavinet through a wah wah pedal, which no one had done, and no one had used a, a clavinet as a funk instrument, which later became Stevie Wonder's mainstay. But Garth Hudson did it first. I did not know That's that. Incredible. Did you guys see um, Heather's comment in the chat about uh, didn't know Atlantic City was written by Springsteen? And then um, Heather, do you want to jump in with us, Heather or Mike, um, and share your thoughts? Well, I love that version that Levon does. I just think that's fantastic. 
And, you know, he's playing the mandolin. I'm pretty sure that's him playing the mandolin in that yeah. song. So it just goes to show you the, the talent that he's got. Sorry, Al. Go ahead. Oh, good. Heather, are you there too? Oh, Heather, yeah. Okay, sounds like Heather is maybe not there or, or just doesn't want to jump in yet. Um, <laughs> Well, let's, uh, you know, we've got another 10 minutes here. Anybody um, want to share anything that they learned or loved or disliked or would have liked to see more? iTunes just made money off me today. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, here's a, here's a fun one. Uh, do you guys think, uh, let's take it, let's swing it back to film a little bit. Uh, for me, I think on some level that The Last Waltz is like the first great music documentary. And uh, yeah. there are like everything sort of after that, whether it's like uh, um, Stop Making Sense, Talking Heads and stuff like that, or uh, uh, even um, was it Wilco's I'm Trying to Break Your Heart. Like there's a little bit of, there's always a little bit of like callback mm -hmm. to the last waltz. Alan, I, I don't know how familiar or how versed you are in, uh, you know, music docs and everything like that, but. There's a lot more callbacks to the last waltz than there is to, uh, the song remains the same. There's not a lot of people chasing wizards through the mountains in their uh, in their music <laughs> doc. I mean, that, that's for sure. Uh, yeah. One of the things that's interesting though, and, and I went through this process and, and maybe John will too now, um, I think most of us sort of encountered the last waltz as our first taste of the band. And what happened with me was I love the last waltz, of course. I love the performances, but when I got to hear Big Pink and I got to hear the Brown album, I'm like, I don't miss the horns. I don't miss the bombast. I kind of like it scaled down like this. Uh -huh. Everything's great on the last waltz, but it's a blowout. It's a, we're going to celebrate all this. Um, to hear those original pure versions that are a, a little humbler, a little scaled back, even a little more intric intricate because there's more to hear in the, in the arrangements. Um, I, that was a great discovery for me. And that's when I really went from being a fan to being just someone who loves their music. That I was like, as long as I'm alive, I'm going to need this music somewhere in my life. Totally. Absolutely agree. I, that's not, and that's not to say that the last book doesn't have, like, for me, as we said, the uh, old Dixie, like, there are some versions that I actually do prefer. But overall, it's mm -hmm. like, to go back and listen to, like, just sort of the more produced and, uh, like, the intentional stuff of particularly some of the songs that aren't necessarily the more uh, identifiable singles. It's, mm -hmm. it's just a really, if you, if you love this band and if you love just music in general, it, it is amazing what you'll catch, what you didn't the 50 times you listened to before. Yes, that's absolutely true. And, and, the, and, and if you are, I'm sure you've gone through this process too. The difference in the sound, the production of each one is they're done in these, the first one done by Columbia, it's done in their church in New York. It's got that sound that they used for a lot of pop music and folk music in the 60s. Then the second album, they wanted this closed in, walled in, thuddy, sort of dark tone. Yeah. And then Stage Fright, of course, they filmed at the uh, Woodstock Theater and they would open the curtain to get different resonances. So you sort of listen for that stuff even, even as you listen to the music. And the, the, each record has a different atmosphere for that. So it's so rich. There's so much to hear. Uh, Heather just popped in and she's having some audio issues, but she said, yeah, was it noted as Robbie Robertson and the band in its time? No. Uh, no. <laughs> yeah, point of, point of contention. I, I found it kind of uh, kind of ironic. And I, I like Robbie. I admire Robbie. I think he's a great guitar player. I think he's incredibly intelligent. But I think he's a guy who has very clearly for a while been trying to establish a legacy. And it was really Levon when he did the Midnight Ramble and Ain't In It For My Health, his documentary. He's the guy that the Americana movement picked up on and said, no, this is our guy here. This is our, this is, this is our, our godfather. Um, and I, th I think Robbie kind of, and not, not wrongly, probably wanted that mantle for himself, but it wound up going to Levon in the end. Well, another thing to remember too, is that Levon sort of takes this, uh, it, it takes that when that mantle by force almost, because he starts doing these sessions, these, we these very famous mm -hmm. jam sessions. He did it for 
a long time too. And people would just show up in Woodstock at his house and they would essentially, they would have a concert and stuff like that. And he, I mean, and when I mean just like anybody would show up, they, like Sting would show up. Elvis Costello would go up. Uh, Lenny Cra- like he would just invite people up and it was a honor to be invited to these jams, these weekend jam sessions. And, uh, and it, it it's, uh, it was a true grassroots thing that he sort of spurred again. Oh yeah, yeah. for sure. Didn't you think, didn't it strike you watching the uh, movie though, when Peter Gabriel came on, I'm like, um, other than having Daniel Lanois as a producer, what, what in God's is... name do you have to do with this? <laughs> as brilliant as you are, what do you have to do with this? I, and I love Peter Gabriel. And, and so I, I think it was an opportunity for them to just get another respected voice in there. Uh, yeah. And again, Wait. Robbie does deserve his deal. He, he really well, he does. sure does. He's brilliant. Rob, Robbie's, a, Robbie's a genius, but, you know, I, I, I really did, I could not not watch this movie, but it's really the Robbie Robertson story. And so if you wonder, you know, where did Peter Gabriel come from? Well, when you watch The Last Walls, look at the, look at the stage and you think, what's Neil Diamond doing up there? <laughs> totally. I totally right? agree. Well, you know, you know, Robbie was producing his album. So Rob, Robbie's very calculated. That's correct. And I don't necessarily hold that against him, but, you know, and I can understand why Levon is, uh, is better. He said, I told Robbie all my stories and Robbie wrote the song. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, if you had a story to tell, you should write the song. Robbie did it. So yeah. uh, complicated story. Fantastic story. I thought it was a good movie. Yeah, it was. And we had talked about it before. And I mean, but like, if you go and listen to the band or to the albums uh, after they had disbanded, no pun intended there. Uh, and you listen to Robbie's music and you listen to the band when they get back together. And it's just like, you really hear the absence and how they could have used each other um, and how they were better together than they were apart. And it's, yeah, it, re- and there's really- good, there is good stuff there, but they never quite reached the heights and uh, the creative apexes that they were, that they were reaching together. Yeah, I think the band needed Robbie to bring in that artistic side, to bring in that, you know, I know Robbie said that the, the weight was uh, inspired uh, partly by, not just by characters they knew, but by Buñuel films. Well, Rick Danko wasn't going to bring that in, you know. So th- that was the combination, you know, that made them special, is he was bringing in the art and the literary quality to go with this incredibly well, good music. He wrote uh, virtually every single song. Yeah. There's very yeah. little that he didn't do. He did. I mean, other than pure it's covers. Because Richard wrote such great songs in the beginning, but then, you know, Richard being Richard, he wasn't really mentally around or emotionally around to write them much longer. Yeah, he didn't get many credits, but... Uh, no. no. Okay, oh, can, can I say, also, uh, I just uh, checked, uh, did a little bit of research today, and uh, I know it's one of the later albums, which I didn't know about when it came out. I think it was at Northern's... Northern's... Northern Lights. Uh, Southern, Southern Cross. Cross when it, that has two great songs on there. Ophelia, which is fun and funky. And then it's got uh, It Makes No Difference that oh. Rick, Rick Danko oh. song, sings. Beautiful. That is the, the most powerful, saddest song ever. But Robbie wrote both of those, you know, yes. amazing stuff. And I want to go back Drifter. and listen to that album again. Yeah. I mean, that's a Danko uh, that he cover. Yeah, he's the one who takes lead vocals on that too. And that, and oh, that oh, absolutely. And, and it's beautiful on the last walls. Just it's just amazing. Yeah, yeah. and, uh, yeah, and Robbie Art wrote it. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah, that that album also has Acadian Driftwood, which is the song that goes back to the flow of those three voices together. And like actually, Man- Richard Manuel might have written that one. I could be wrong about that, but so it, it would be an interesting hypothetical what if if man if 1986 doesn't happen and mm-hmm. uh you know and for the you know spoiler alert to you know the people listening i mean uh, he suffered with some uh mental health issues and commit suicide yeah. in 1986 uh, but like if he was maybe was able to get over some of those things if because the band i think he would have been there and you know might have added more substance to uh to those later albums yeah well, I saw an interview too. I think it was Danko that said, uh, well, actually, let me back up and say, uh, 
Robbie made it sound like we were all going to go our separate ways and take some time off and everything, and then we'll all come back together. Rick Danko said, no, this is Robbie's idea. He was done. He, he quit. Mm -hmm. he, and we, we wanted to keep playing. So, and, and that's fine. I understand why a guy would want to do that. I mean, look at, look at Ronnie Hawkins. <laughs> you don't want to look like that in 15 years. So, but, uh, and in Robbie's defense, and again, I, I don't want to necessarily, but like it was probably getting really difficult to manage all the personalities. Oh, I, I don't blame him. I, I, yeah. I think it's really complex. It's a really complicated issue. And I th think that's why it's such a great story. Uh, but it's not like, you know, the guys decided we'll take a little time off. Yeah, Robbie, Robbie decided, decided that. And yeah. they wanted to keep going. <laughs> Which I, there's the Grammy, uh, and this is a, I, and Alan, you can probably speak to this better. There was a famous like sort of reunion at the Grammys, I believe it was. Mm -hmm. and, and they don't invite Robbie to come perform with them, which right. is the, oh, wow. which is the slap of all slaps. It is, it is. I'm, but you know, somebody was saying, I forget, it might've been in a review I read of, of uh, this film. They said, you know, Robbie's not perfect, uh, but he's not the Mike Love of the band. No, <laughs> so and not, that's not an important thing to point out. <laughs> he, he, he put up with a lot of shit. He did. And they put him through a lot of shit. And it, I mean, again, it's just like, I'm critical, but as I'm watching this and you start to think about it, and maybe this is just age getting the better of me, but it's just like, you're like, God, that must have been impossible <laughs> to deal with. <laughs> it, it must have been. There's, yeah. there's a scene in Robbie's book where he's literally chasing um, Levon and I think Rick around a barn trying to get the drugs away from them. And they're just <laughs> screaming at him and throwing rocks back at him. It's, yeah, I don't know how you continue with that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Well, it, this has been really fun, guys. Um, as Stu said, I, I think, uh, yeah, I would anticipate with this documentary that there will be some albums purchased, uh, some album sales, and uh, it's always great to, uh, and Mike, I really appreciate, um, you know, you, you putting this film on our radar. Um, I'm always down for some some discovery and uh, yeah, this music is fantastic. So hey, anytime you wanna talk and listen to the band, I'm, I'm around. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Alan, that thank you. Goes for all of us. <laughs> yeah. Alan, thank you so much uh, yeah, for being yeah. a part. Thank, thank you. Mike, thank you so much for being a part. Thank you everybody for joining us. And um, we've got a couple more films left. So check out our schedule on, um, the Film Society Facebook page. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. This has been fun. Have a good night. Great Go job. watch the last one. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Ian.